Well, thank you for the honor and the privilege of being here in uh, this chapel service uh, today. And certainly it's a joy to be back at uh, my wife's uh, alma mater. We've been here for a few days uh, now and had the joy of speaking to the uh, BCM uh, on Monday night and uh, speaking in Dr. Baskin's class uh, yesterday and uh, kind of the apex of that being here in uh, chapel uh, this morning. A uh, little fun fact, uh, this is Brooks Chapel, uh, named in honor and memory of a man named William Walker Brooks, who was a middle Georgia businessman who died in the 1960s. His estate funded uh, two uh, gifts at Baptist institutions. It funded this chapel here at uh, Shorter that is named in his honor, and it funded an endowed professorship at uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which ironically, I held the William Walker Brooks professorship in my years at Southern Seminary. So uh, as a former Brooks professor preaching in the Brooks Chapel, I, I, it's kind of a coming together of worlds, if you will, uh, in, that, uh, in that sense. But um, I'm thankful for Shorter, thankful for the uh, hospitality of uh, D-Roll, for Dr. Dallas and the invitation to, uh, to be here. And uh, it's an interesting time to be just alive, to do what we do, especially in uh, this post-COVID pandemic world. Uh, most of you, of course, have obviously lived through the COVID pandemic, and to put it uh, mildly, I think we're going to look back uh, and we're going to have what life was like pre-pandemic and what life has been like ever since. And in fact, one of the questions that I've been asked as I've had the chance to preach and to teach and to minister has been, uh, when are we going to get back to normal, right? Right? Uh, when, when is life going to settle down? We're going to get back to, to normal, as it were. And I want to submit to you something uh, that is kind of a, of a point I want to ponder this morning. I think that's the wrong question to ask. Because if you will, the, the world we knew in 2019, pre-pandemic, it's never coming back. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And the Lord has really impressed upon me a text of Scripture that... Uh, I've heard preached, I've preached it before, but uh, the Lord has got to give me fresh eyes to look at this text because I think that the Lord is doing something far more significant in this text than maybe at first glance we really appreciate. So if you have a copy of God's Word, either in print or electronic form, Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to be at. Uh, Mark uh, chapter 2, and uh, we're going to pick up in verse uh, 18, we're going to read down to verse uh, 22. Uh, Mark chapter 2, and again, if you've had a uh, New Testament survey, you know Mark is the shortest uh, gospel of the four. Uh, many scholars believe it's the earliest gospel for that uh, reason that Mark and Luke drew from, uh, Matthew and Luke drew from Mark and such. The synoptic gospels, John's a uh, little different uh, approach. But we're going to pick up verse 18 of Mark 2, where the Bible says, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible this morning, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. People came and asked him, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples do not fast? And by the way, uh, again, we don't get tone and uh, tenor and pitch uh, when we just read the text, but we can sort of kind of guess that this is not asked out of mere interest in inquiry. And in fact, you notice uh, throughout the Gospel of Mark, in fact, I made this point at the BCM on Monday night, Mark 7, we have kind of a similar uh, example of where there are these who are sort of insinuating, there's something wrong with you. You're not really doing it the right way. I mean, wh why is it that John's disciples and the Pharisees fast, but, but you don't? And Jesus gives an answer of some length here. That concludes with a familiar statement, but one that I think is actually far more encompassing than we have appreciated. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. And then he makes a transition. Verse 21, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth and a worse tear is made. Verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. 
Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost as well as the skins. No new wine is put into fresh wineskins. Now again, as Baptists, we kind of start reading about wine, and we get tripped up over that, and we can miss the point about what Jesus is actually trying to get to here in this text. It seems very clear that Jesus is doing something that, again, uh, we can kind of miss in our looking at the immediate context and not appreciate what he's getting at. Jesus, evidently here, is making some kind of differentiation between what he regards as wine and what he regards as skins. Now, again, we don't use wine skins in the same way, so if I can make it a little more understandable, I have this... Uh, Dixie Cup uh, here, courtesy of uh, D-Roll, and uh, he was kind enough. Uh, he, he brews uh, Starbucks kimono uh, roast, I think, uh, dark roast coffee, and uh, coffee is a precious gift of God, and so uh, he, he was kind enough to share some with my wife and I uh, this morning. We both appreciate coffee. Uh, we drink it black the way God intended without any uh, uh, interference or artificial uh, ingredients uh, included in it, and, um, and, and so we really enjoy coffee, but we really can't enjoy coffee without some kind of container to put it in so we can consume it. Like, we, we can't just have coffee because, well, it, it would make a mess. It would go everywhere. It, it would be unable to be utilized or, or consumed. And so, we have a coffee cup, a Dixie cup. Now, the Dixie cup really is not all that important to me, just to be blunt. In fact, I'll, I'll recycle it when, it when I'm done with it. I, I'm not going to take it home with me. We're not going to use it again, per se. It, it, it's merely functional. Its value is only in relation into what it does to keep my coffee warm and in a way that I can drink it without making any mess. So, if you will, the, the coffee is the wine, this Dixie cup is the skin. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's making a point. You can have a coffee cup without coffee in it. In fact, they all handed me an empty Dixie cup that I poured the coffee into, okay, to be able to enjoy the coffee. But you really can't have the coffee without a cup or the decanter or, you know, whatever your favorite type of, you know, consumable may be. There's no just th such thing as just coffee <laughs> without some kind of container to put it in. The container isn't really what's important, but the coffee is. But I can't enjoy the coffee without the container. I think Jesus is doing something very significant here. He's making a point. The point is this. When it goes back to the question about fasting, he's making a point that fasting is like this coffee cup. Fasting was never intended to be an end in and of itself. Fasting was merely a means by which those people could have a deeper, more meaningful encounter and experience with God. It was a means to an end, but fasting was never the end. But evidently what had happened in the uh, religious uh, culture of that day was that those religious leaders had put all of the emphasis upon fasting as if fasting were the wine when Jesus is saying it's a skin. And Jesus is saying, fasting can go. It, 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 it's, not, it's not of ultimate importance. It, it's useful and serviceable like that, that Dixie cup, but, but it's not the end in and of itself. And if you read especially Mark's gospel, I think you find other examples of where Jesus does this with other things. In fact, um, Let's just keep reading a little bit. Verse 23, on the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? 
And Jesus gives an answer of some length here, quoting about David and such. Verse 27, then he told them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. They had made the Sabbath into wine. But Jesus says the Sabbath is a skin. It, it, it's useful, but it's not of ultimate priority. It can go. You see that? Mark 7, where I was Monday night uh, with the BCM, if you want to turn there and look, this question comes up about um, uh, what defiles. And uh, Jesus makes the point that it isn't what enters the mouth that defiles, but what comes from the heart. And in fact, Mark makes the point that here in one brush, one stroke, Jesus strikes out all of the kosher dietary laws, all of the differentiation between clean and unclean food, where he makes the point that all of these things that were so prized in that day in terms of how they identified, I, I don't, I've never eaten anything unclean. Jesus strikes it all away and says, don't call anything that God has made unclean. It isn't what enters the mouth that defiles what comes from the heart. He internalizes and personalizes these matters. You can look throughout the Gospel of Mark. We don't have time to do it, but other places where the, the holiness codes. Jesus makes the point, you don't have to have all of the ceremonies and the rituals. You don't have to have all of the external trappings for there to be holiness. And, and maybe the one that to me is, is most profound, look at Mark 13. Mark 13. In the temple. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look! What massive stones! What impressive buildings! And, and we know, again, if you've had Old Testament survey, how important, how central the temple was in that old covenant system. It was all centered around the temple, the sacrificial system, and the priests, and the Levites, and everything was around the temple. The temple was such a source of, of pride for, for, for the Israelites, for the Jewish people. And look at what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Holy smokes. You see that? That will be destroyed. But that's not the end. The temple. And all that was associated with it. The, the, the priestly system, the sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, all the rituals, all the things you'll learn about when you read Leviticus and Numbers and all that kind of good stuff. All these things, Jesus says, are skins. They can be gone. Gone. And by AD 70, they were gone. <laughs> the temple can be here, or it can be gone. And in a sense, it doesn't matter. Because God will still be here, and you'll still be here, and our mission and our mandate hasn't changed. It can go on with the temple. It can go on without the temple. The temple can be. Remember, Jesus has this great scene where he goes into the temple. What does he find there? Money changers. People who were buying and selling, who had perverted and distorted the house of God and turned it into a den of thieves, Jesus says. And Jesus says, throwing the tables over, throwing the bums out. You guys have desecrated what was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. You've perverted and distorted what this was all supposed to be. You, you've, you've tried to turn into wine something that was meant to be a skin. And it can go. And when it goes, it doesn't mean God's left. It doesn't mean the mission is ended. What was so prized by them 
Jesus says is dispensable. And what they regarded as dispensable, Jesus says should be prized above all else. Because what had they missed? What they had missed evidently was what Jesus puts the accent mark upon, upon what matters most. Which was what? What does he consistently do? He quotes the scripture to them to confront them in the fact that they had so elevated and prized their human traditions. They had vitiated the authority of God's word. They cared more about all of the externalities. The fasting, the Sabbath, the temple, all of the stuff. It's like holding on to that Dixie cup long after the coffee's been drank and thinking this Dixie cup with no coffee is still going to satisfy and to nourish. Where did Jesus put the accent mark? Upon the Word of God and upon people. People. Isn't that the point where he's confronted about the Sabbath? Isn't that the point about when he's healing people and being criticized by the religious? Isn't that the point where he says, listen, it's not not about buildings and things. It's not about all this other stuff. What matters most is that you're found faithful to God's Word and to giving yourself to helping to connect People who are far from God to Christ. Everything else is dispensable. Not saying it's garbage to be thrown out, but saying its function and its place is not one of ultimate importance. I think this is a word that the Lord is certainly using in my life. Because to be transparent, it is very easy, even in the ministry, even in higher education, to put a lot of time and energy and emphasis upon things that ultimately I believe Jesus would regard and identify as skins and not wine. It's very easy. You can be so consumed with things, and things have their place, but they're not what matters most. And sometimes the Lord allows experiences to come into your life, things that you would never have chosen to experience in and of your own self, to kind of recalibrate and to reset you back to what matters most. And I think COVID-19, while I certainly claim no particular insight into the secret counsels of God, read Deuteronomy 29, 29, I have to believe that the Lord has allowed this to shake a lot of us back to what matters most. For years in Baptist life, we put a lot of emphasis upon things, church facilities. If you build it, They will come until COVID-19 and nobody's going anywhere. And you know what we figured out? We can still do church and we don't have to to actually have a building. Higher education. We all became online institutions for a season. And you know what we figured out? We can still deliver education and we don't actually have to have all the things that we thought we used to have to have in order to do it. When we think about the gospel, for so many years in Baptist life, we had to have programs and plans and packages and all this kind of stuff. And and all those things are just being stripped away. And frankly, there's a scariness to that because, again, we kind of like what's familiar and safe and, and comfortable. And, and, and why, why can't we just use that? 
In fact, I've seen essays and articles by leaders who've talked about, well, look, let's just ignore what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's try to party like it's 2008 once again. And let's just, let's just go back. And by that, they don't mean just going back to the primacy of Scripture and people. They mean, let's go back to some of the old methodologies. Because after all, if the old methodologies worked in 1985, surely they'll work in 2025. And we run the risk of committing the same error that these people did in Jesus' day, of confusing certain things that are meant to be identified as skins and thinking that they're the wine. For those of you who are students here at Shorter, whatever, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you are entering into a world where, frankly, there are less certainties today in terms of things you can expect culturally and otherwise than probably any time in American history. And a lot of the old assumptions and things, that just it's all breaking down with a speed that is unlike anything we've ever experienced. And, and candidly, there, there's, there's a scariness to that, just to be blunt. The flip side is, one of my prayers for your generation, particularly for those of you who name the name of Christ, is that God will help you to be a generation that will rise up and really recapture what it means to put the accent mark where it should have been all along, and that is upon the Word of God and upon people. Because I can tell you, if you get out, you're going to find there are a lot of people out there who are hurting, who are broken, who are alienated, who are estranged. And they're desperately looking for someone to love them and for someone to share with them where they can find real hope. And candidly, that's something we should have been doing all along. But at times, life will put you in a position to where it's very easy to give your time and your talents and your treasure to things that ultimately Jesus, I believe, would regard as skins and not wine. May you be a generation that will emerge from shorter in whatever vocational direction the Lord gives to you to be a people that the Lord will use you to put the accent mark where it should be always. That you will give your life to living out what it means to be truly a person who prizes the Word of God and people's lives above anything else. I heard a pastor when I was in seminary who said, one of the things you need to make sure that you do in ministry is to make sure your first priority is always going to be on the people who are going to cry one day at your funeral. And that word has stuck with me. I was single then, and now as a husband and a father, and having been able to do a lot of other things that show up on a resume that candidly just don't mean much in the grand scheme of eternity. I can tell you what matters most. I want to be a man of God. I want to be a faithful husband. I want to be a dutiful father. I want to be someone who's giving my life in submission to the Word of God and in service to people. And everything else can find its place after that. That I believe, honors what Jesus is getting at when he's talking about not putting new wine into old wineskins. Let's together pray in a post-pandemic era that God will help us develop fresh skins, that we can use new methodologies, new techniques, new ways by which we can connect people who are far from God, that they might come to know Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father, we're thankful for these moments together around your word. God, you are so wonderfully good to us. You are better than we deserve. So what we deserve is death and hell. What we deserve is to be eternally separated from you. But Lord, in your loving kindness, you've given to us everything. Lord, in you, all the blessings of salvation are found. Lord, help us, all of us, to really grab hold of what it is that you prize and value most, what you would have regarded as the wine. And to help see in proper relationship the things you would regard as skins. And to always put the accent mark where it belongs. Bless these men and women. Lord, you know every story, every situation, every journey. 
Draw those who are far from you home to you. Bless the administration, faculty, and staff here at Shorter University. Use them, Lord, in a powerful way. Dismiss us with your blessing. Help us to walk in the way of Christ, standing upon the word, bearing the fragrant aroma of the truth, beauty, and goodness of the gospel as we go. For we ask and we pray all these things by the Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. And you're dismissed.